Hello English students, you're watching Excel at English, where we analyse in detail materials for the AQA Language and Literature A-Level Syllabus. This particular video is looking at a poem from the Meantime Collection uh, by Carol and Duffy, and it is the first in the series looking at a poem titled The Captain of the 1964 Top of the Form Team. Now, you may be familiar with this poem, but if you haven't already read it, I suggest that you read the poem at least three times. And if you can, experiment with ideas such as pace and expression so that you really end up exploring this sense of voice in the poem. Um, one way to read the poem might be as follows. The captain of the 1964 Top of the Form team. Do wa diddy, baby love, oh pretty woman, were in the top ten that month, October, and the Beatles were everywhere else. I can give you the B-side of the Supremes one. Hang on. Come see about me. I lived in a kind of fizzing hope, gargling with Vimto, the clever smell of my satchel. Convent girls. I pulled my hair forward with a steel comb that I blew like Mick, my lips numb as a two-hour snog. No snags. The Nile rises in April, blue and white. The hummingbird song is made by its wings, which beat so fast that they blur in flight. I knew the capitals, the kings and queens, the dates. In class, the white sleeve of my shirt saluted again and again. Sir? Correct. Later, I whooped at the side of my bike. A cowboy mounted it running in one jump. I sped down Dyke Hill. No hands. Famous. Learning. Dominus. Dominate. Dominum. Dave D. Dozy. Try me. Come on. My mother kept my mascot gonk on the TV set for a year. And the photograph. I look so brainy you'd think I'd just had a bath. The blazer. The badge, the tie, the first chord of a hard day's night loud in my head. I ran to the spinny in my prize shoes, up Churchill Way, up Nelson Drive, over pink pavements that girls chalked on in a blue evening, and I stamped the paw prints of badgers and skunks in the mud. My country. I want it back. The captain. The one with all the answers. Bzz. My name was in red on Lucille Green's jotter. I smiled as wide as a child who went missing on the way home from school. The Keeney. I say to my stale wife, six hits by Dusty Springfield. I say to my boss, a pint. How can we know the dancer from the dance? Nobody. My thick kids wince. Name the Prime Minister of Rhodesia. My country. How many florins in a pound? So, in summary, this poem sees the captain recalling the glory years of his youth in the 1960s, and he recalls his life in a kind of quiz format. Uh, the captain has all the answers, and his success is exciting, as, as are his memories of his youth. He feels a sense of entitlement and his domination. Later in life, in the fourth stanza, he seems disappointed by those around him, and he also, throughout the poem, seems oblivious to some more sinister traces of an oppressive and not very pleasant decade. Some of the themes are listed in the box here, looking at ideas about misogyny, entitlement and power. Also, uh, ideas looking back at the past, nostalgia, memory, youth and age, the passing of time. Some cultural themes as well, nationality, identity, popular culture and 1960s politics. In terms of voice, this poem is clearly a dramatic monologue which has a clear single character voice. That voice is addressing an unknown interlocutor, an unknown uh, addressee in this conversation, which presents it as if it were one side of an imagined conversation. Uh, it is up to you, of course, to decide what you think Duffy is trying to convey about times, places, people and events in terms of those specific ideas that you think um, you, you are taking individually from this poem. There is a lot of key knowledge, particularly cultural knowledge, underlying this poem, uh, perhaps more than is listed here. So if there's anything that you're uncertain of, then you'll need to Google it.
But the 1960s, really importantly, sees the beginning of youth culture and the establishment of a distinct teenage identity, uh, things that, of course, we still have with us today. Um, this was led by icons like the Beatles and Rolling Stones. Uh, the Rolling Stone frontman was called Mick Jagger. And these uh, individuals symbolized a kind of sexual revolution in many ways. Um, it suddenly became acceptable for there to be public displays of sexual desire, something that previously had been um, a really powerful taboo. But there were still a lot of strong repressions um, in society and a lot of limitations, particularly surrounding homosexuality, which was uh, still illegal at the time. Um, Dusty Springfield, a singer mentioned in the final stanza, was a 1960s uh, music artist, an exceptional music artist, well worth listening to, uh, but she was um, forced to conceal her homosexuality and, like Marilyn Monroe in America, was very much a victim of an abusive and exploitative music industry. Um, this is one of many of the unpleasant social realities which are alluded to in this poem. Um, other uh, cultural aspects of the 60s are represented, uh, such as references to Rhodesia, which was uh, an openly racist um, government of a white nation in Africa. I believe it's now, Zim now known as Zimbabwe. Um, but this was a, uh, a really bitterly racist um, regime in Africa that the UK, um, uh, as a former colonial nation, um, didn't exactly, I don't think we uh, supported them, but we didn't exactly condemn them or do anything about it. Um, also, there's a reference there to missing children in this poem, um, which uh, is an allusion to the Moors murders, um, a very, very disturbing and tragic uh, serial killing of children that took place in Manchester in the mid-60s. What are the distinctive language features? Uh, here are three that you can think about. Um, the first one would be the proliferation of nouns, including proper nouns and personal nouns in this poem, many of which are related to powerful or successful figures. Now, these nouns generally convey the captain's love of facts and knowledge, but they also uh, convey um, implicit ideas, or they're also suggestive. There are a number of um, powerful past figures, um, uh, all, or most of which are male. Uh, Cowboy, Churchill and Nelson are the names of the streets, um, implying um, figures of kind of colonial or imperial power, uh, kings and queens. Um, there's sexual boasting in there, uh, implied through reference to Mick Jagger and the lips numb as a two-hour snog, but also the fact that his name is written in Lucille Green's Jota. So a combination of kind of real figures and, ima and I guess, imagined fictionalised figures uh, in Duffy's um, characterization. There are also um, subtly misogynist representations conveyed in some of these, uh, these nouns. Uh, Dyke Hill, um, an unpleasant uh, slur um, for um, homosexual homosexuality, uh, which has since been reclaimed, uh, or his reference to convent girls, um, which is more than a little bit um, um, creepy. Uh, these references, um, these different names that flash by in the poem, do so in the form of a rapid succession. They are like a montage of cultural and personal memories, uh, and they give the poem some of its kind of breathtaking speed. Throughout the poem, there are there is fragmented grammar. Um, the captain is, of course, speaking. And as we discussed earlier, this is an example of a kind of dramatic monologue. And so the writing represents a kind of spoken register. So the captain's conversational voice is uh, captured and presented as a kind of an overbearing and arrogant bore who dominates conversations. Uh, he says, no snags, or try me, come on. He's almost uh, like, uh, like a pest. Um, there's this pathetic sense of entitlement running through um, the poem, uh, my country, he says over and over again. These are fragments, of course. They are aspects of spoken language that go somewhat unexplained that we have to um, interpret by imagining them as part of his voice. Finally, there's a pattern of dynamic verbs in the, in the poem, uh, most of which uh, used for him to describe the pace of his childhood in which he sped, whooped, 
was saluting, mounted and stamped, uh, all forceful and powerful um, actions conveying how uh, dynamic and lively he was as a young man. Looking at a closer analysis, we can look at a range of features highlighted here. Um, in red there, a number of key cultural references which convey perhaps uh, more than apparently they do at surface level. Uh, the references as discussed in Key Knowledge to the Moors murders, repression of homosexuals and racism, uh, conveyed through that proliferation of nouns. Um, these are often proper nouns, but in the case of a child who went home, the indefinite article A um, implies that several children were abducted, and therefore reminds us of the case uh, of the Moore's murder, but keeps the identity of those ch those children obscured compared to the named celebrities like Dusty Springfield, The Beatles and Mick. Um, so this is a somewhat obscure reference to the Moore's murders, um, showing how the captain is kind of oblivious to these meanings, but reminding us um, perhaps very powerfully uh, that there is a sinister underlying underlying unexplored negativity uh, to the 1960s and that it's not all quite as rosy as the captain presents it. Uh, with regard to grammar we can look at the variety of sentence forms and functions used to represent speech. Uh, those fragments already discussed such as the captain, the keeny, uh, in which he um, basically enjoys recalling uh, his own nicknames or his own monikers for himself and the def definite article there the um, shows his sense of his own importance and status and his uniqueness he is the only one the only captain the only keeny um, other fragments in this section include that possessive my country which is repeated elsewhere um, and fragment like nobody we interpret these in context as ways of, uh, of Duffy conveying his sense of arrogance. Um, he is gifted, but others around him uh, are a disappointment to him. Throughout this stanza presented here, there's a pattern of possessives. My name was in red on Lucille Green's jotter, my country. Um, five possessives in total. The questions that the captain asks others use varied forms um, which we can interpret uh, in a kind of a conversational setting. Um, so sometimes normally when we ask questions uh, we do so most obviously by using uh, interrogative sentence form um, such as how can we know the dancer from the dance but uh, the captain also uses imperatives uh, which are quite aggressive and quite rude uh, such as name the prime minister of Rhodesia um, rather than asking as a question it's uh, formed as a command um, which, uh, if we're looking at politeness theory, uh, interpreting conversational pragmatics, is um, really quite um, a rude way of using language. Um, also, this is true of the way that he uses a declarative uh, as a form of questioning his wife. I say to my stale wife, six hits by Dusty Springfield. Once again, he doesn't use the interrogative form. Uh, he uses instead a declarative, but his wife presumably knows exactly what he's asking for. Um, and we can uh, interpret from this that he really uh, is a sickening bore uh, who is um, rude and overbearing to other people. And um, we're left, I suppose, to imagine what his wife really thinks of him. Um, Duffy uh, uses Lexis and phonology uh, to describe his attitude towards his family in many insulting ways, uh, particularly those adjectives thick for his kids and stale for his wife. Here is a man who is really um, quite insulting towards his own family, certainly not an endearing characteristic. Duffy, though, cleverly foregrounds um, some of the striking imagery in this stanza uh, using assonance, uh, assonance where we have aligned vowel patterns. A good example of that is I smiled as wide as a child who went missing on the way home from school. Um, the long I vowel in smiled wide and child um, is adding a subtle emphasis to this image. It's quite an important image. It contrasts um, the smile of a child, presumably on like a missing uh, a missing person's picture, 
um, and the really quite sinister or troubling knowledge that that child has gone missing or been abducted. Um, and that subtly foreground with that foregrounded, sorry, with that um, ascent pattern. A uh, similar thing is done as the uh, Duffy does a similar thing in um, giving the captain's voice describing his uh, children. My thick kids wince. This time we have a shorter ascent and eye vowel, but we also have this um, quite bitter plosive avila plosive formed at the um, by the tongue on the roof of the mouth. The uh, my thick kids wince, helping, I think, to foreground a sense of his disgust towards his own children. Thinking of some of the connections that you might make um, now that you're itching to go and write up an analysis of this poem, you could think about perhaps comparing the presentation of childhood in poems like Cliché Kid or Litany. You might think about the way that past lives and places are presented in a poem such as Never Go Back. Um, both this poem and the biographer are both um, dramatic um, monologues uh, written in male characters who are somewhat insecure individuals. And so it would make an interesting comparison if you were to look at masculine identity in both of those poems. Um, memories and attitudes to the past in Beach Coma uh, and this poem would make another interesting comparison. It's of course possible to make your own choices and if you picked a poem at random from the poems on the syllabus uh, it would be interesting to think about which themes would connect those two poems. Uh, very finally then, a few more words. These are from Philip Larkin, um, a really fantastic poet of the 1960s. Uh, this poem is taken from his collection High Windows. Uh, it refers to the um, sexual revolution of the 1960s and it's called Annus Mirabilis. Sexual intercourse began, which was rather late for me, between the end of the Chatterley ban and the Beatles' first LP. Up to then there'd only been a sort of bargaining, a wrangle for the ring, a shame that started at sixteen and spread to everything. Then all at once the quarrel sank, everyone felt the same, and every life became a brilliant breaking of the bank, a quite unlosable game. So life was never better than, in 1963, though just too late for me, between the end of the Chatterley ban and the Beatles' first LP. Thanks for your focus and attention, guys. I hope you found this video useful. Don't forget to check out the other videos in the series. Bye.